Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we are continuing our discussion of Emma. I was hoping to have finished the rest of the book last night, but I wasn't, so I'm hoping to finish it instead over the weekend. Today is Friday. So today I'm actually going to go even more off the cuff than usual. I don't have my notes with me. And the reason for that is that my notes from my past section of reading is very similar to some of the notes that I've had over the past few days, which is just observing these recurring patterns and the ways in which Austin is building out this sort of structure in which Emma is blind and she continually re retreats back into her her imaginative world to create a reality that she wants. And so a lot of it is me furiously highlighting because Emma just can't get it right. It's a little bit frustrating. But I wanted to take a step back with that in mind, with that structure in mind, and kind of take this lesson maybe to reality, to each of our lives. I often say that I really enjoy reading classics because they can teach us how to be better people, that they can show us how our world and ourselves can be better. And I think Emma has a very classic lesson that really comes up a lot and sort of the epic hero cycle. And it's one of those classic lessons, those classic pieces of wisdom that's really important, I think, for us all to internalize. Now, I mentioned in my first video last Wednesday, um, over a week ago now, that Emma is, has created a sort of symbolic womb for herself. And that's part of what makes it so difficult for her to want to leave her current situation. Even when she's sort of imaginatively musing over Frank Churchill, or even when she was cons taking, sort of decompressing about the um, Elton misunderstanding and him wanting to propose to her rather than Harriet Smith, a lot of what we see is that Emma is she's thinking about what she would have to give up in order to be married and and as a result she sort of you know imaginatively created this very insular insulating experience certainly supported by her father's prejudices uh, against change to uh, prevent her from having to make difficult decisions and move you know from this safe womb environment if you will but if we take a look at the structure of the hero cycle the hero is always made, ha, has a call to adventure. And for our other heroines in Austen novels, you know, the circumstances of their lives force them to do it. For the Dashwood sisters, we see that the father dies, and so they have to leave their family home and go on this new adventure. For the Bennett sisters, you know, it's because Netherfield Hall is let at last. And even more fundamentally, it's the impending the fact that their father's estate is entailed away, so whether Netherfield is let or not, something has to change for them. Something's going to change for them. They just don't know when. For Catherine from Northanger, obviously she's invited to Bath, but a young woman accepts such an invitation, so it's perhaps more willingly engaged in than some of the others. For Anne Elliot, it's that her father and must retrench, they're having money problems, etc., etc. So we see for all of the, oh well, Fanny Price, it's your packed and shipped off. So for all of these other characters, you know, the, the adventure is forced upon them, but for Emma, we have something unique where she has enough power and autonomy to decide if she wants to take up the call. And most of the novel is her choosing not to take up the call. And why? Why do we avoid making change in our lives? And it's, for the most part, we don't want to encounter the unknown. We make a lot of mistakes when we encounter the unknown. And that's exactly what Emma is going for, through. In those few places where she engages with reality, when she isn't retreating back into her imaginative world, you know, she's enacting and embodying her belief system, i.e., you know, one belief would be that Harriet Smith and Elton should get together and get married, right? And so she embodies that, she encourages that, she puts forth actions to sort of try and make that become not just part of her imaginative world, but part of the reality. And when reality sort of rebuffs her and pushes her back, then she has to admit that she's made a mistake. And whenever we encounter mistakes in our lives, it's like we have to reframe our worldview. It turns out that reality is quite immovable. And that is part of what the hero must do to sort of incorporate these new 
beliefs, these new realities, these new, you go out into this unknown world for Emma, the world of flirtation and matchmaking and marriage and so forth. And uh, you, you make a few mistakes before you learn how to do it with fluency. And very early on in the novel, we also learn that Emma has never had to go through flirtation and marriage, etc., etc., to get the power that she has right now because she's basically mistress of the Woodhouse household. And we see with what proficiency she's able to execute her powers. That happens in the very first scene where, or in one of the early dinner parties, where she first meets Harriet Smith. And she spends so much time sort of admiring Harriet Smith and deciding that she wants to be friends with her that she almost forgets that she has to play the role of hostess. And when it comes upon her that she has to, like, oh, it's time for me to go do this, she the book describes that with what fluency and what, what speed she's able to do everything properly, almost unthinkingly. And this is sort of another stumbling block for Emma, is again, she already has all of the powers and all of the rights pretty much of a married woman without having had gone through everything else that all the other uh, ladies must go through in order to have that position of authority and, and power. Um, so all of that to say that Emma continues to avoid actually engaging uh, with her adventure, which is finding a spouse, finding a mate, because she doesn't want to make mistakes. And I think also because, we, as we've talked about before, she has a little bit of awkwardness about what are clearly her feelings for Mr. Knightley. That came up again as with the seat, with the ball. I just read that chapter. The ball has finally happened. She's dancing with Frank Churchill, but the whole time she's spending it looking at Mr. Knightley and admiring what a gentleman-like man he is. And then she finally asks him to dance. Again, she's so assertive and has takes on such a traditionally masculine role of authority. It's very, very interesting the way that Austen has structured this novel. So we see that Emma has to make her mistakes and has to sort of learn new footing in this new terrain. She's so confident and competent in her own domain. That's part of the reason why she doesn't want to leave it. But obviously, that's part of the adventure for Emma. That's part of what she must do. And so that's the lesson for us as well, is that I think we're, we're change averse because we don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to make fools of ourselves. We are afraid of encountering the unknown. But that's really the only way to move forward in life. And I think with that comes this sense of personal responsibility for everything that's within your domain. And we see Emma growing in that as well. So as... Annoying as I'm finding her right now in this stage of the novel's development, I think it has some timeless messages for us, and I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. Mm -hmm.